So, hello, my beautiful VIPs, very inspiring people. Today, we're going to talk about creating a new reality, a new reality for you and your loved ones. But first, let me welcome, welcome my friends who are joining through the Zoom room, the VIP members joining through the Zoom room. Let me say hello to my friends coming in the Google meeting room. Thank you for joining. I see Brett and Allison and Joyce, Donald. Hello, where are you tuning in from? Dubai, excellent. Deborah, Maria, welcome my dear friends. I see Joyce in the clubhouse in the clubhouse. Janet, Andre, Sonia. Sorry if I'm missing you, but there are about 50 people in each of the chat rooms, so I'm not going to go down individually. I just want to welcome you to this evening's Manifestation Monday. Okay, and all of you are VIP members or have a special pass for today. As a VIP member, you can get access to all kinds of beautiful perks, including retreats here in Greece, one-to-one -one coaching online or in person, and many other goodies like the online course. So let's go. I want to tell you something. People say to me all the time, Dr. Agio, I'm in the unknown. I can't predict my future. And I always answer them the same way. The best way to predict your future is to create it. Not in the knowing, but in the unknown. So how many people in this audience believe in the idea that the way you think has some effect on your life. I'm just curious. So I'm in the right place, right? Yes? So all of this knowledge that you're learning this webinar, every time you learn something new, you make new connections in your brain. That's what learning is. And the Nobel Prize laureate Candell in the year 2000 found that when people learn just one bit of information, they doubled the number of connections in their brain from 1,300 connections to 2,600 connections. But if they didn't review that information, if they didn't repeat it, if they didn't think about it, those circuits were pruned apart within hours or days. So if learning is making new synaptic connections, then remembering is maintaining and sustaining those connections. And I now know that if you give people sound scientific information, and science is the contemporary language of mysticism, science demystifies the mystical. All of these new sciences point the figure at possibility. And as people begin to engage information, philosophical, theoretical knowledge, intellectual data, as they make those new connections in their brain, if they can turn to the person next to them and explain what they just learned, they're firing and wiring in those circuits in their brain, installing the neurological hardware in preparation for the experience. So then when they apply what they learn, when they personalize it, when they demonstrate it in some way, they're going to have to modify their behaviors. And if they can get their behaviors to match their intentions, if they can get their actions equal to their thoughts, their mind and body working together, you're going to have a new experience. And in the midst of an experience, all of your five senses plugged into the external environment. And as your brain is gathering all this vital sensory data, all that information rushes back to your brain and jumbles of neurons begin to organize themselves into networks. 
the moment those neurons string into place, re-enhancing, reinforcing ideas that were made, the brain makes a chemical. Now the chemical become emotions. So now you're teaching your body chemically to understand what your brain and body has understood. You can say that knowledge is for the mind, experience is for the body. And in that moment, you're embodying the truth of that philosophy, chemically instructing your body to understand what your mind has intellectually understood. And the moment you feel that emotion, you are literally signaling new genes and new waves, and you are rewriting the biological program. But if you've done it once, it means you should be able to do it again. And if you can repeat any experience over and over again, you are going to neurochemically condition your mind and body to work as one. So when you've trained something so many times that your body know, now knows how to do it better than your mind, now you're mastering that philosophy. It's enabling you. It's second nature. It's easy. It's familiar. You've practiced it so many times that you no longer have to consciously think about it. You know how you do it, but you don't even know how you know how because that was subconscious programming. So our job then is to go from philosopher to initiate to master, from knowledge to experience to wisdom from mind to body to soul, from thinking to doing to being, to learning it with your head, practicing it with your hands, and knowing it by heart. And you and I have all the biological and neurological machinery to do this. And I can tell you right now that common people around the world are doing the uncommon. They're healing themselves of fatal diseases, reversing scars and wounds that were from past experiences from their childhood or from their adolescence, or they're creating better lives and new lives and new opportunities, and even having mystical experiences that transcend language. So what I'd like to do today is I'm going to develop concepts and ideas. And when I see you wrap your mind around that concept or idea, and you go from beta brainwave patterns that you are in now to alpha brainwave patterns, I know that you are consolidating that information neurologically in your brain. And you're going to begin to fire and wire those circuits in your brain in preparation for those experiences. You're going to begin to install the neurological hardware in your brain so that in your future you can access those futures to do something differently. How many of you understand what I'm saying? You should have some transformation in some way. And so when you walk back into your ordinary life, then your biology will be greater than the conditions in your life. Do you think your thoughts have something to do with your destiny? Of course they do. Well, you think 60 to 70,000 thoughts in a day. And out of those, 90% of those thoughts are the exact same thoughts as the day before. I know. It's like you're a robot on an automatic program. So 90% of your thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before, then your life should stay exactly the same, right? Logical. The same choices are going to lead to the same behaviors, yes or no. The same behaviors are going to create the same experiences, yes or no. The same experiences are going to create the same emotions, yes or no. And those same emotions are going to drive your very same thoughts 
and your biology, your neurocircuitry, your neurochemistry, your hormones, and even your genetic expression will stay the same. And there's a principle in neuroscience that says that nerve cells that fire together, wire together. So if you keep thinking the same thoughts, making the same choices, demonstrating the same behaviors, creating the exact same experiences that stamp the same networks of neurons in to the same patterns, all for the familiar feeling called you. In other words, your comfort zone, so that you can just feel like you. Let's imagine you keep doing this for the next 5, 10, 25 years. Would you agree that you hardwire your brain into that signature? It's, it's your identity. It's, the, it's what you've created. The most commonly fired um, box behaviored and emotions, which is acquired through frequent repetition, right? We're like robots on automatic pilot because those programs were put in a long time ago. So how you think, how you act, and how you feel is called your personality. And your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. So the present personality who's sitting here today called you has created the present personal reality called your life, yes or no. So then if you wanted to create a new personal reality, a new life, you would have to change your personality, yes or no. Which means you're going to have to start thinking about what you've been thinking about and change it, yes or no. Yes. You are going to have to become conscious of your unconscious habits and behaviors and become so aware of them that you don't go unconscious again. Yes or no. And then you're going to have to look at those emotions that keep you anchored to the past and decide, do these emotions belong in my future? Yes or no. So most people try to create a new personal reality as the same personality, and it doesn't work. It literally have to become someone else to change your life. Your brain is organized to reflect everything you know in your life. Your brain is a record of the past. It's an artifact of everything you've learned and experienced till this moment. Are you with me still? So then if you're not being defined by a vision of the future, you're left with the old circuits of your past and you will be predictable in your life. Yes or no? Yes. And if feelings and emotions are the end products of past experiences, and we can remember experiences better because we remember how they feel, the moment you wake up in the morning and you come back to your senses and you lay in bed and you start thinking about all your problems that are connected to different people and places and conditions and things in your life, the moment you get in touch with the familiar feeling called you, you're in your past. And if those emotions are driving your thoughts and you can't think greater than how you feel, our feelings have become the means of thinking, then you are thinking in the past, yes or no. You just told me that you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny. And if you can't think greater than how you feel, your past is your future. Yes or no? How you think and how you feel is called the state of being. That thoughts are the vocabulary of the brain and feelings are the vocabulary of your body. That cycle of thinking and feeling creates your state of being. Now think about this. If your brain is a record of the past, hardwired via, in a certain way, because most people are thinking, acting, and feeling the same way, 
and they have emotions that they've become so familiar with that they don't even know that they feel guilty. It's just as how they feel. They don't even know that they're unhappy because that's how they define themselves. And if those emotions are driving your thoughts, turning on the same circuits in your brain, firing at the same exact sequence, patterns and combinations, firing and wiring those circuits to produce certain chemicals for them to feel more suffering and more guilt, the more they... The moment they feel more guilt and more suffering, wow, I'm feeling pretty bad. So they think more thoughts equal to how they feel. And the cycle of thinking and feeling creates their state of being. And the redundancy of that process conditions the body to subconsciously become the mind. And now your entire state of being is in the past. Are you with me still? And you can't go to a new future holding on to the emotions of the past. Now your body is your unconscious mind. And it does not know the difference between an experience in your life that creates an emotion, an emotion that you are creating by thought alone. So the body is believing it's in the same past experience, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. And if the body's been conditioned to be the mind, the body is literally in the past. How many people understand? So then to change then, would be, mean then that you'd have to be greater than your body, yes or no? Greater than the emotions that keep you anchored to the past and greater than those habits that keep running you unconsciously into the same future. Are you with me still? You've all had experiences in your life that have produced a strong emotion, yes or no? whether it's a trauma or betrayal or a shock or something amazing that happens, the moment you feel differently inside of you, you pay attention to what caused it outside of you. And the moment that happens, the brain takes a snapshot, and that's called a memory. So the stronger the emotional quotient from an experience, the greater the long-term memory, yes or no. So then people have a reaction to someone or something in your life, and you don't know how to control your emotional reaction. And you allow that emotional reactions to linger for hours or days. You know what that's called? That's called a mood. I'm not in the mood. I'm in a good mood. I'm in a bad mood. I'm in a mood. What's wrong? I thought you'd never ask. I had this thing happen to me five days ago, and I'm memorizing my emotional reactions. Yes or no? And if you keep that same refractory period of chemicals running for weeks or months, that's called a temperament. Why is he so bitter? Why is she so angry? I don't know. Let's ask him. Uh, what's wrong with you? I had this thing happen to me seven months ago, and I'm having one long emotional reaction. Yes or no? And if you keep that same period of emotions for years on end, that's called a personality trait. And most people's personality are defined by their past experiences. And they wear their emotions on their sleeve or on their forehead because that's who they think they are. And so then someone goes up to them and says, buddy, why are you this way? And he'll say, well, I'm this way because this experience happened to me 10 years ago, which from a biological standpoint, it means that I had an event in my life that altered me and I have not been able to change since that moment. So then think about this. The latest research 
in memory. The latest scientific research tells us that 50% of what you talk about in your past isn't even the truth of what happened. You're making it up. It's your narrative. It's a story. Your memory is being creative. It's interpreting things. So, so many people are reliving the, a past that they didn't even have. So then you wake up in the morning and you're, and you're like, wait, 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 I don't feel anything. I feel a little dizzy. Oh, I feel a little guilty or I feel a little anxious. Oh, that's familiar. So now I'm ready to start my day. So the moment you feel that emotion, you're in your past because emotions are a record of the past. If those emotions are driving your thoughts or driving your behaviors, you're going to be predictable in your life because your past is going to be your future. How many people understand now? Good. You think an insecure thought, you feel insecure. Yes or no? The moment you feel insecure, the brain is checking in with the body and saying, oh, you're really feeling insecure. So yeah, let's generate some more insecure thoughts and you're gonna make more chemicals for you to feel insecure. And then the moment you feel insecure, those feelings are gonna drive your thoughts. So then you're gonna continuously hardwire, reinforce the old program because you keep thinking the same way. And you continuously con condition your body emotionally from your past so your entire state of being is in the past. And if you're not being defined by a vision of the future, then your past will be your future. How many people understand me? So that to change then would be to be greater than your body has, has been conditioned by your past. So you wake up in the morning, the morning you come back to your senses, you glance over to the person laying next to you or your pillow, and you're like, oh God, how did I get here? Who is that person <laughs> laying next to me? And then you remember, and then you're like, oh, now you're feeling all your problems. And then you're like, oh yeah, that feels familiar. That's myself. This is my life. And so then what do you do? You reach for your cell phone and then you check your WhatsApp. You check your Twitter, your X, your Facebook, your Instagram, your text, then you check your email, and then you check your other email, LinkedIn, and then you tweet something. And now you're really connected to your past present reality. Yes or no? Then you get up out of the same side of the bed every day because you sleep on the same side. You put your slippers on, you scratch yourself the same way, you put your robe on, and you have the thought of the toilet. And the next thing you know, your body follows your mind right to the toilet. Yes or no? Your body follows your mind. You have the vision of the shower. And the next thing you know, you're naked, you're in the shower, and you're washing yourself the same routine way. And then while you're in the shower, you have this incredible vision of yourself dressed and what you're going to wear into the kitchen and you drink your coffee from your cup and then you'll have cereal facing the same way, facing the same chair with the same spoon or you may watch the news to remind you how bad the world is. You get in the car, back up, drive to work the same way, see the same people, that push the same emotional buttons. Now, even if you're a housewife, you're going through certain routines or you're working from home, you're going through certain routines and then you think about your competition and that stresses you all out. You use your friends to reaffirm your addiction to suffering. You use your parents to reaffirm your addiction to guilt and you just are addicted to so many negative, fearful, anxious thoughts. Then you go into the grocery store sometime and you go down the corridors that you want to buy the same food. 
You go home, you cook the same meal, you eat the same food, you sit in the same chair, you watch the same television show, you get done, you call your sister or your brother or your girlfriend and you complain about how bad your day was and then she complains back and you know, you complain back to her and then all of a sudden you brush your teeth, you floss, you get in bed and you go to sleep and you wake up the next morning and here we go again, yes or no? So did your brain change at all that day? No. You could say that you were thinking the same thoughts, performing the same actions, living by the same emotions, but secretly you expect your life to change. So if a habit is uh, a redundant set of automatic unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and emotions, that's acquired through frequent repetition. The habit is when you've done something so many times that your body now knows how to do it better than your mind. So would you agree that the moment you wake up and you've been doing it for 20 years, your body is on autopilot and it's dragging you into a predictable future based on what you did in the past? Yes or no. And you can take your past, lift it up, and put it onto your future. And you know what it's called? Karma. Because you're living the same life every single day. And you've lost your will for a program. And 95% of most people, by the time they're 35 years old, it's a set of automatic programs, automatic thoughts, emotional reactions, unconscious behaviors and beliefs and perceptions and attitudes function just like a computer program. And now they're going to try to change your life with the 5% of your conscious mind working against 95% of what you've programmed subconsciously. Are you with me still? So you can think positively all you want. You can say, I'm wealthy, I'm wealthy, I'm wealthy, I'm making 50000 a month, 50000 a month. And that is never going to actually going to enter the body, okay? It's, it will stay in the brain because the body is programmed in the past. So if you're not being defined by a vision of the future, the moment you wake up in the morning and you see the same people and you go to the same places and you do the exact same thing at the exact same time every single day, now your personal reality is creating your personality because it's your environment that's causing you to think and feel equal to everything that you know. Are you with me? As long as you're thinking and feeling equal to everything that you know, you keep creating more of the same. How many people understand? Great. So every single person in your life, every single thing, it has a neurological pattern in your mind because you've experienced it. So the moment you see your boss or your husband or wife, the moment you enter your house, the moment you're driving your car, the moment you're reacting to someone or something, the moment you see that person, it's your external environment that's turning on different circuits in your brain, causing you to think equal to everything that you know. So that as long as th you're thinking equal to everything that you know, you keep creating more of the same, yes or no. So then to change, to truly change, is to be greater than your environment, to be greater than the circumstances in your life, to be greater than the conditions in your world. And every great person in history understood this. So then the moment you are being defined by a vision of the future, and that vision that was greater than the conditions in your environment, then you would have to agree with me. You're no longer in your past. You're being greater than the conditions in your environment. So then what does it take? A clear intention. Telos. In Greece, we call it telos the ending, the outcome. How many people in this audience have a wild idea? What would it like to be really wealthy, to be free, to be healthy? The moment you ask that frontal lobe question, all of a sudden the creative center of the brain is turned on. And this is what you did. You said, oh my God, let me just be open to an answer. And the frontal lobe 
has a connection to all other parts of the brain. And like a great symphony leader, it begins to call up different networks of neurons that are already mapped in your brain from the things you've learned, the things you've experienced in your life, and then seamlessly pieces them together and you get a vision. And that's called your intention, all right? You're selecting a new potential in the quantum field that you haven't experienced yet. And to the passionate person, the morning they have that vision, the thought becomes the experience. And the end product of an experience is an emotion. And they start to feel the emotions of their future before it's happened. And the moment you feel that emotion, you're raising your energy and your body is getting a sampling, a taste of the future. And when you combine a clear intention with an elevated emotion, you just changed your state of being from living in your past present reality to living in your future present reality. But that's just the beginning because everybody in this audience sat down and said, okay, what choices do I have to make? Let me review them in my mind, yes or no. Then you said, what behaviors do I have to demonstrate? What are the things that I have to do? And you refute those. What goals do I want to accomplish? What experiences await for me? And as you begin to write these goals and experiences down, you would start to feel more elevated, right? Just, but then you did something really brilliantly. You wrote down the thoughts that you no longer wanted to think, and you became conscious of those unconscious thoughts. I can't, it's too hard, I, it didn't work in the past, I'll start tomorrow, I don't feel like it. And you became so conscious of those unconscious thoughts that, they will never slip by your awareness unchecked. And then you said, what choices do I have to stay away from? And you began to become conscious of those unconscious choices that you've been making all day. And you became so conscious of them that you wouldn't go unconscious again. And then you said, what behaviors and things that I'm going to stay away from and change and you review them, what experiences that I know that I have to stay away from in my environment, and what emotions will bring me to a lower denominator. And every day you reviewed who no, you no longer wanted to be and who you did want to be. And over and over again, you'll keep doing it. And you know what you do then? You gave up your social engagements. You might not have slept in. You just changed habits, you know, because now you're more passionate because you're putting your attention and your energy in the future and not your past. And if you keep doing this over and over and over again, all of a sudden you'll start getting these signals in your world, little synchronicities, little coincidences that your environment was, is reflecting back to you that you're on the right path. And then there came a moment where you know it's going to happen. When you just take your foot off the gas, the moment you did that, you, you're just allowing the experience to come to you. You're relaxed. You're chilled. And the moment you felt gratitude and wholeness, and so you start changing character. You become more loving, caring, grateful, more present, more forgiving in your life because you feel better about yourself. So now here's my question. Think of a time in your life where you were being defined by a vision of a future that you sought and it didn't happen. What happened then? You got a clear intention. You got inspired you felt the elevated emotion, you were in a whole new state of being, and then you know what happened? I'll tell you. You got busy. You didn't have enough time for it. You had people to see and places to go. You know, you got distracted, parties, dinners, and you got distracted by your external environment. 
or you just didn't feel like it one day because you were tired or had a headache or you had a fight with someone three days ago. And all of that means then that it was your body, your environment in time that talked you out of that future. And the moment you shrunk back into mediocrity, you found people in your life who did the same and people use each other to reaffirm their addiction to mediocrity and they call that normal. So the hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before. And here's the old self, and here's the new self. You have to cross a river. And the moment you decide to make a different choice, get ready, because it's going to feel uncomfortable. There's going to be some uncertainty. It's going to feel unfamiliar. It's going to become unpredictable. And the moment you say, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to change, and you're going to decide to make those changes, you just stepped into that river. And if the body has been conditioned to be the mind, the servant is now the master. Now the body's running the show. And guess what happens the moment you step into the unknown? The body says, whoa, this doesn't feel right. And it starts sending signals back to the brain. And you start to hear voices in your head. And those voices are, start tomorrow. This doesn't feel right. It's my mother's fault. It's my ex-husband's fault. It's my ex-wife's fault. It's the politician's fault. What's wrong with me? It must be something wrong with me. And it's the same thoughts that you've always had. It's just happening behind the scenes of your awareness. But now you've become mindful and conscious of it. And if you respond to the same thought as you always do, the same thought is going to lead to the same choice. The same choice is going to lead to the same behavior. The same behavior is going to create the same experience. The same experience is going to produce the same emotion. And then people say, this feels right. This is uh, here I'm comfortable. You know, it feels familiar. Going from the old self to the new self is the neurological, biological, chemical, hormonal, genetic death of the old self. And people say to me all the time, Dr. Agio, I feel anxiety. I can't predict my future. And I always answer the same. The best way to create your future is to create it, not in the known, but in the unknown. Becoming comfortable in that place is the mastery. What thoughts do you want to fire and wire in your brain and put your attention behind? What behaviors do you want to demonstrate in one day, one lifetime? And as you begin to rehearse those behaviors in your mind and you're truly present, the brain does not know the difference between the experience going on out there and the experience going on in here. And now you're installing the neurological hardware to look like the experience has already occurred. And now your brain is no longer a record of the past. Now it is a map to the future. And so then the last part is the tough part because can you teach your body emotionally what that future is going to feel like before it's made manifest. That means you cannot wait for your wealth to feel abundance and confident and worthiness. You can't wait for your success to feel empowerment and gratitude. You can't wait for the new relationship to feel love. You can't wait for your healing to feel wholeness. You can't wait for a mystical moment to feel, ah, that's the old model of reality of cause and effect. Waiting for something outside of us to give us relief for the emptiness that we feel inside of us. The more we feel better inside of us, we pay attention to a new memory. In the quantum model of reality, 
is about causing and affecting. The moment you feel starting worthy and abundant, you are magnetizing your wealth. The moment you are empowered in a state of gratitude, you are walking towards your success. The moment you're in love with yourself and in love with life, you'll create an equal. The moment you are in awe of the moment, you're going to have a mystical experience. And the moment you feel whole and complete is when your healing begins. And that's causing an effect. And there is no person that is so special that you are excluded from that equation. This is for everybody. Can you believe in a future that you can't see and experience with your senses yet, but that you've practiced in your thought and in your body? The latest research in neuroplasticity says that you can actually change your brain just by thinking. And can you fall in love with your future potential in this quantum field? How many potentials exist in the quantum field? Infinite. And can you begin to emotionally embrace that future reality before it's made manifest to such a degree that your body in its unconscious mind begins to believe that it's living in that future reality, but in the present moment where you are signaling new genes a new mind that will affect your body to experience it as if it's already here. Just think about it. There's physical evidence in your brain and body to look like the experience has already happened. Now your brain and body are no longer living in the past present reality. They're living in the future present reality. And so then, if there's physical evidence in your brain and body to look like the experience has already occurred, you get to relax. Because you've been there, done that. And the experience is just going to come and find you, like the shoe will fit. And it's going to come in the way that you least expect it. And you know why? Because if you can expect it, it's nothing new. It's got to rock your world. It's got to catch you off guard. It has to leave no doubt that what you did inside of you produced some amazing effect outside of you. And the moment you correlate the changes you made inside of you with the effect you produced outside of you, this is ethos. That is alignment. Would you agree then that if the environment controls most people's thoughts and feelings, if most people are thinking and feeling in the same way they condition their body to become the mind, and if they're on a program living in a predictable future based on what they did in the past, and they're never in the present moment, and I assert, when you're not in the present moment, you're running a program, would you agree then that it might be a good idea for you, when you're defining yourself as a vision of the future, that you sit down and close your eyes and disconnect from your external environment? Yes or no? It's a brilliant idea. Play some music, close off so that there's less sensory information coming into your brain. Sit your body down and make it stay, 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 stay right there. I'll let you know when it's time to get up because I'm busy reprogramming my brain. So if you agree that if you're not smelling anything or tasting anything or eating anything and you're not experiencing anything in your environment and feeling, then all of a sudden your inner world is going to become more real than your outer world. And if you can surrender your body into the present moment, then you would have to agree then that you are defining your life by thought alone. And it's no longer your outer environment controlling how you think and feel. Now you're changing your inner environment to be greater than your outer environment, your body in time. Do you understand what I'm talking about, Ed? And that's what is used in the model of change. And it's called meditation. The word is the same root as the word medicine. So it means to ponder on 
and to heal. To know thyself, as Socrates said, but those thoughts have been happening behind the scenes of your awareness the entire time. Most people are just too distracted by their external environment. So then if you're sitting in a meditation and you're becoming conscious and familiar of your automatic patterns and behavior, what comes out of your mouth, if you're sitting there become so conscious of those unconscious programs, you would have to agree with me, you probably won't go as unconscious again. And if you're becoming aware, oh my God, I've been suffering and feeling guilty and playing the victim for the last 30 years of my life, and I didn't even know I felt this way, would you agree that the moment you're observing those things of mind and body, you're no longer the program. You are the consciousness observing the program, and you're beginning to objectify your subjective self. So you are seeing yourself through the eyes of someone else and you're disengaging from the biological program. And what if you then said, what is the greatest expression of myself that I can present to the world? What's the vision of my future? And you began to fire and wire those circuits in your brain, deciding what thoughts you do want to pay attention to, installing the hardware, sitting down and rehearsing the choices and behaviors you're going to be making in one day, the act of mental rehearsal then begins to install the neurological hardware in your brain. And if you keep repeating it, the hardware becomes the software program. And all of a sudden, who knows? You may think like an unlimited person. You may act like an abundant person, a multimillionaire, a free human being, a happy human being, a fulfilled human being, a peaceful human being, an entrepreneurial human being, a creative human being. And if you kept playing this new program over and over, every day cultivating these elevated emotions and teaching your body ahead of what you would experience ahead of the actual experience, would it become familiar to you? If you were training suffering from freedom, pain from joy, it would be easier for you to feel that way, right? So it's like you're feeding two wolves. Which one are you going to feed? If you can get up then from your meditation and maintain that modified state of body the whole day, something unusual is going to happen in your life. It's the law. And it will come in a way that you've never anticipated. Because if you can anticipate it or predict it or expect it, it's nothing new. It's the unknown. And that's coming from another dimension, another reality, a parallel universe. And when you feel that surprise and energy from the emotion, it's going to inspire you to want to create again. And you will look back to your entire past when that experience falls out of the sky and you won't want to change one thing in your past because it brought you to the present moment. And that's the moment the past no longer exists. How many people understand that? Do you understand that? You know, they did an experiment. They did this experiment, okay, with some healers. They they set these three vials of DNA right in front of these expert healers and people who pray. And they said to these people, now there's DNA in these three bottles. And what we want you to do with your mind, with your intent, is we want you to see this DNA wind and unwind and keep having the intent to see the DNA wind and unwind. So they practiced it over and over again. When they checked the DNA, guess what happened? Nothing. Intention did nothing to change the DNA. So then they said, okay, what we want you to do now is we want you to create an elevated emotion like compassion, freedom, love, and joy, and freedom. Just an emotion. We just want you to radiate this energy beyond your body, beyond your body. We want to see if it will affect the DNA. They did it over and over and over in sustaining that elevated state. When they checked the DNA, guess what happened? Nothing. <laughs> An elevated emotion did nothing to change the DNA. But when they said to them, we want you to see the DNA unwind and then get in touch with the feeling of how it would feel if it 
actually unwound ahead of the experience. 25% of the DNA literally unwound. You see, the thoughts that you think are the electrical charge in the quantum field, and the feelings that you emote are the magnetic charge in the quantum field. And how you think and how you feel broadcasts an electromagnetic signature that influences every single atom in your life. The thought sends the signal out and the feeling draws the event back to you. So then the question is, what are you broadcasting on a moment-to-moment -moment basis in your life? Because if you're walking around in lack of suffering, you're saying into the unified field, oh, infinite universe of intelligence, giver of life, I am broadcasting suffering into the field. Bring me an experience of suffering. Just send it so I can suffer a little more. Because that's what you're saying. So we are not punished for our sins. We are punished by our sin. And sin is an attitude. And an attitude is how you think and feel. Are you with me? Think about this. Most people, their entire state of being is in the past and their energy is in the past. Yes or no? So then if where you place your attention is where you place your energy and you have all of your attention on your emotions that keep you anchored to the past, then all of your energy is in the past. And if you wake up in the morning and you start thinking about all the people you have to see and the places you have to go and the things you have to do and your known familiar reality, you keep your attention on all those knowns, then your attention is projecting into a predictable known future. And that means then that you have very little energy in the present moment to create because all your energy is in the past or in the future and no energy in the present moment. So then I want to talk about the sweet spot of the generous present moment because all potential in the quantum field exists in the present moment. And only when you are present in the moment will you be able to create a new future. You know when someone's present in your life because they're paying attention to you. And you know when someone's not present in your life because they're not paying attention to you. So then here is that infinite intelligence that's living within you and all around you. The quantum field, the unified field, whatever you want to call it, it's both personal and universal. It's within you and all around you. It's the very intelligence that's keeping your heart beating and digesting your food and organizing all those trillions of functions while you sit here and have a free will. It's the giver of life, but it's also the same intelligence that's creating the galaxies and the universe and causing flowers to bloom. It's personal and universal. It's within you still. It is omnipresent. Why? Because it is in a realm beyond space and time. In that realm, it is completely present. So then here it is right here. And most people's attention is on somebody, somewhere, sometime. And they're never looking towards the present moment. And that's because all their attention has been put on becoming a someone, owning something, being in some future time. So you can never have that face off or that tete -a -tete, the looking at this infinite intelligence because you're simply not showing up for your date with destiny. The moment a person goes from being a somebody to a nobody, from a someone to a no one, from something to nothing, from somewhere to nowhere, from some time to no time, that's the moment you take your attention off your outer world and line up in the present moment. You are pure consciousness. And now the observer is observing and saying, oh, you're present with me? Now I can see what you want to create. If you want to hide the divine somewhere from human being, you would hide it inside of them. Now, even the scientific knowledge says that with thousands of brain scans, 
we know that the moment some people, we, are us, get outside our ego, outside that personality, and opening your heart, and this has been measured thousands and thousands of times, when you have a coherent brain and a coherent heart, you're changing your whole electromagnetic field. I would start each meditation with an elevated emotion. And as you start to create this elevated emotion of your future, we can actually measure what it does to the heart. And it turns out that the heart all of a sudden becomes very coherent and organized and the brain begins to harmonize. And when you live with resentment, anger, frustration, the heart becomes very incoherent, just like the brain as well. So the moment the, the heart starts to resonate with orderliness, it begins to produce a measurable magnetic field, a measurable magnetic field. And that field can be up to eight meters wide. And that's energy. And that energy carries an intent, a message, because all frequency carries information. And all of a sudden, you are beginning to broadcast your whole vibes into the field. And when you do that for an extended period of time, it has an effect on matter. You are now creating your future because you are more energy than matter. You are more wave than particle. So what's the biggest reason they give up on their dreams? Because of the hormones of stress. And stress is when your body is knocked out of homeostasis. Stress is when your body is out of balance. And the stress response is what your body innately does to turn itself back to order. A deer, for example, is in the woods and it notices a pack of wolves coming. The moment the deer perceives a threat, it mobilizes an enormous amount of resources to take care of its body, right? It's getting ready. It's tapping into these vital resources. It begins to produce a rush of adrenaline of chemistry to, to be able to run, fight, or hide. All these juices are pumping. The heart rate increases, the respiratory rate increases, the blood is sent to the extremities, glucose is mobilized, and now the body is tapping its vital resources in its environment. Yes or no? That's great for the short term, because if a deer can outrun the wolves, it will go back to grazing 15 minutes later and returns back to balance. Human beings have those same exact mechanisms, but what if it's not a predator? What if it's just your co-worker or your mother-in-law who's sitting next to you, who you've had some tough experiences in the past with? Would you agree that we usually just turn on those stress responses as we have in the past, and now you can't turn it off? This is going to cause illness and sickness and dis-ease in you. If you keep doing this over an extended period of time. Those hormones of stress are very addictive. The most addictive substance. The body gets a rush of adrenaline. The brain gets a rush and people get addicted to the emotions of stress, aggression, hatred, fear, anxiety, worry, guilt, shame, suffering. And you use the conditions in your life to reaffirm your emotions. You need the bad job. You need the poor relationship. You need the difficult circumstances in your life because it makes you feel something. So if the hormones of stress are highly addictive and people use the conditions in their environment to reaffirm their addictions to these emotions, is it possible they've become addicted to their, the life that they don't even like? Now listen to this. We can turn on the stress response just by thought alone because of the size of our brain. In other words, out of the infinite potential in the quantum field, people will select the worst case scenario when they're living in survival. The moment you select that worst case scenario in the future, you emotionally embrace it. Like, I'm gonna be homeless, I'm gonna die poor, I'm gonna die alone. And what happens is you're thinking of this worst case scenario, you're knocking off your 
equilibrium. You're destroying your immune system. You're sending these chemical signals to your body because it's in the past or in the worst case scenario future. So you're turning on stress response just by thought alone. And the hormones of stress are highly addictive. People become addicted to their own thoughts. Yes or no? It's a scientific fact that the long-term effects of the hormones of stress downregulate genes and create disease. So then if we can turn on the stress response just by thought alone and those chemicals of stress push the genetic button that create disease, is it possible that your thoughts can make you sick? So then if your thoughts can make you sick, is it possible that your thoughts can make you well? So then when you and I react to some condition in our the external environment, we draw from this invisible field of vital energy surrounding our body and we turn it into chemistry and the field around the body begins to shrink. Now we become more matter and less energy, more particle and less wave. And the moment you feel more like matter, every single time, people will always try to control, predict, and force outcomes in their life and fight for results because they are matter trying to change matter, not energy trying to change matter. So these very chemical of stress make us more materialist because if we can't see it, if we can't hear it, we say it doesn't exist. And because people spend so much of their time living in survival, it makes sense that they're focusing on matter and they're not paying attention to the wave of possibility. Are you with me still? So then under the hormones of stress, we try to control everything in our life and every single person, every single problem, every single thing, every single place has a neurological network in our brain. And when the brain becomes aroused, we shift our attention from one thing to another problem to another problematic person, and we just keep activating these circuits. And if we keep doing that for an extended period of time, like a lightning storm, the brain begins to function incoherently. When the brain functions incoherently, we function incoherently. And when the brain isn't working right, we're not working right. Are you with me still? And then people switch their brain on into emergency mode, and now they can't switch it off. No new information can enter the nervous system that isn't equal to the emotion that they're experiencing. Why? So they're attuned to pain. Why? Because if you're being, if you're being chased by some animal, it's not the time to think and create and be open and trust your heart. It's not a time you're buckling down in fear mode. This is a time to run, fight, and hide. And people spend their majority of their life that way. How many people understand? You understand what I'm talking about? You're living in fear mode and you're addicted to fear mode. We live in a realm in this three-dimensional reality where there is infinite space. How big is space in this three-dimensional reality? It's eternal. It's infinite. So then we experience time by moving through space. So if I'm going to walk from here to the wall, it's going to take me a certain amount of time to get there. Yes or yes. So if people are living as materialists, defined by their body, defined by their space and time and their bodies, it makes sense that they will reach their goals. Yeah, they will get that mansion, but it's going to take them 30 years to pay it off. Yeah, they'll get the new relationship but they're gonna to have to go on Match.com and look at body car parts over and over again and go on a lot of dates and finally find the right person. And then of course, then they'll have the dream to buy the house, but then they gotta get the right job. So then they have to put in their resumes and go on a lot of different interviews to settle for a job they don't even like. 
and all this is going to take time, and at the end of 30 years, they'll pay it off, like they'll be too tired to enjoy it, because it takes time in this three-dimensional reality. What if then, if a person has the ability to live in the present moment, be in their heart, and all of a sudden, instead of thinking about the predictable future or remembering of the past, they labored for the present moment. What if then, instead of narrowing your focus on the problem, on the threat in the external environment, you were able to take your attention off of the matter, off of objects and people and things, and find the generous present moment and go from a someone to a nobody, from someone to no one, from something to nothing, from somewhere to nowhere, from some time to nowhere. That would be the moment that you would begin to disinvest your energy out of this three-dimensional reality and all of a sudden now you become pure consciousness. And as you begin to move through the eye of the needle and become nobody, no thing, nowhere, and no time, to disidentify with their ego if you keep surrendering into the unified field, field. you'll go from somebody to nobody into the consciousness of the universe from the consciousness of just your little ego to the consciousness of everyone and everything. From the consciousness of something to the consciousness of nothing. To the consciousness of everything. From the consciousness of some time, specific time, to every time, to infinite time. Isn't that the quantum field, the unify field? This is it you melt into God, in, into this infinite field of information that's beyond space and time. And when you create from that place, you no longer have to go anywhere to get it. In fact, when there's a vibrational match between your energy with some potential in the quantum field, you will collapse time and you will draw the experience to you. Because as Einstein said, the field is the sole governing agency of the particle. And energy affects matter. And the moment that happens, when you become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, and no time, all of a sudden, you're free of that specific person's problem of your old problems. When you've gone from beta to alpha and you've moved out of your analytical mind, all of a sudden different compartments of the brain that were once subdivided, if you're no longer thinking about those things, all of a sudden everything starts to synchronize and unify and integrate. The front of the brain starts talking to the back of the brain. The right side of the brain starts talking to the left side of the brain. You have hemisphere synchronicity. And what sinks in the brain links in the brain. And all of a sudden, the brain starts moving into this psychic field. And the moment those two halves of the brain come together, and they're in hemisync, their union of polarity, the union of duality and opposites and separation is wholeness and love. At the same exact time, all of a sudden, the heart starts going into coherence and it starts to produce immeasurable magnetic field. You're no longer drawing from the field, you're contributing and creating, co-creating with the field and that expands into a frequency that carries information and now you put your intent on that energy and you are broadcasting a whole new signal into the field and that's why you see people sitting in their meditation all of a sudden you can actually do a brain scan and see how the brain becomes synchronized or with certain frequencies 
and vibration. So all of a sudden, when your brain goes into that kind of coherence, all of a sudden, you feel so whole, so complete, so in love with life, that it's impossible to want, to need anything. You're not even going to need food. You're not even going to think of food. You're just going to be feeding off this energy. You're not going to even need money because you are going to have tears of joy rolling down your face. Like, in, like when you're in a deeply grateful prayer, that you're so grateful you cry. You've merged with the whole. You are in no need state. You become more willful, more free. You become more mindful because you're an infinite mind now. You become more conscious because you are one with infinite consciousness. You become more giving, more loving. Its nature is your nature. The universal mind becomes your mind. And all of a sudden, you don't have to do anything because it is your state of being. From fear, you've transformed into freedom. And when you're in this beautiful state, everything just comes to you easily, effortlessly. So, my dear friends, I think it's time for you to go practice your meditation, your mindfulness, if you need any help, you can always tune in and download and listen to my meditations, my guided meditations to get you started. But right here and now, it's time for practice. I've explained to you how the whole system works, how God works, the game overall director of this beautiful simulation we call life. I've explained to you how you're not supposed to take it that seriously that it's not made of matter, it's made of energy, the quantum field. So release yourself of matter and all good things will come to you. And sending all my love and peace to you.